All right, welcome back folks. It's time for our next 224 Valkyrie video. If you saw the last video, I'm sorry. It was a bit of a mess. We had problem after problem after problem, some self-inflicted, some equipment related. Our groups were terrible. It was all bad. So we are just going to reset. We are going to simplify. We are going to remain focused and attack this one step at a time. It's going to go great. We are going to accentuate the positives and eliminate the negatives. Now, at this point in the uh, proceedings here, you are more informed than I am. You have seen probably the thumbnail of the video, perhaps even the title of the video. You know what bullets we're probably going to be shooting and stuff like that. I haven't even picked that out yet. The last video, we only shot the 90 grain Sierra Match King. Our group sucked. So I want to try something else today. Let's just throw some different stuff at this guy because from the experience in the last video with 90 grain hand loads and the little bit of 90 grain factory ammo I've shot, both the Sierra Match King and the uh, Federal Fusion ammo, I haven't been very impressed with any of their performance. So I don't know, are we in a situation where my one in seven twist barrel just isn't fast enough for these bullets? I don't know. Let's try some lighter stuff today see how they perform, maybe we'll learn something. A couple candidates that I pulled out, the 77 grain Sierra Match King, I'm almost certain we're gonna shoot this guy. This has been an excellent shooting bullet for us in 223. I've also got the 69 grain Sierra Match King. I don't know, we probably won't shoot that one this time. We'll get to it eventually, but probably not this video. I've also got the 80 grain Hornady ELD Match. I also just got a box of the 85 grain Nozzer RDFs. Last couple videos here on my channel, we've shot the RDFs in 6.5 Creedmoor and then in 223 and had some pretty decent success with them. So I went ahead and picked up a box of the 85s for the Valkyrie. I don't know if it'll be this video, but we're going to shoot that guy. And I've also got some of the 60 grain Nozzer ballistic tips. That's what Federal puts in their varmint ammo. I've shot some of the factory ammo with that bullet and it's been the best group I've shot with the gun so far. So that's kind of where my head's at right now. We'll get to it a little bit later. We'll make our final decisions. We're almost certainly going to shoot uh, Alliant Power Pro 2000 MR. This is one of the few powders we've got some factory load data to work from. So that's probably the powder we're going to stick with. Now, a, a huge source of problems in the last video were my Forster dies, right? I broke the seating stem in my seating die. It didn't fit the 90 grain Sierra Match King very good in the first place, which is why I was screwing with it and it ended up breaking it. The sizing die, we ended up needing to bump the shoulder. What was it? Four or five thousand? Yeah, it was five thousandths. We had to bump the shoulder on our brass five thousandths to get it to resize the body enough to where it would fit in the chamber and run smoothly. So, so far we're having a few problems with the Forster die set. Well, I called them up and got some, some new seating stems. Actually, one of these guys, the, uh, this guy is for my 223 ultra micrometer seating die. This guy is for 223. We're definitely not going to mess with this guy in this video, but eventually down the road with the, uh, the bench rest die that I got in this set, you can take off this entire upper part and replace it with the upper part from the ultra micrometer die and kind of swap some parts around. We may get to that eventually. So I finally got a new seating stem for that die. So yeah, that's probably coming in a future video. The other seating stem I got is for, why did I close that up and put it back over there? I knew I was gonna to need to be back in here. Here's the seating stem that came in my bench rest cedar die. The one that I broke in the last video, I got scotch bright stuck down in the, <laughs> inside the seating stem, it was a mess. Well, here's the replacement. And it says right on here, bench rest seating die, or yeah, bench rest die seating stem 224. This is not the same seating stem that came out of my die. You can see this part up here is a different length and guess what? The replacement they sent me fits the 90 grain Sierra Match King. Fits it much better. It's not quite perfect, still a little bit wobbly, so it's not, not, not exactly 
a perfect fit, but it is 150,000 times better than the stem that came in my die originally. That's very good news. So hopefully with this new seating stem, this die will be back in business and we'll be able to seat bullets with it again. Now in the last video, we ended up using a freaking 22 nozzler die just to seat our bullets, which definitely could have also been a source of, uh, a source of our accuracy problems. It was just a mess. In this video, we are not gonna screw around with the Forster dies. We've got the parts we need, we'll deal with it later. But in today's video, I wanna bring a new die set into the picture. As you might be able to read, if you can read, RCBS 224 Valkyrie Small Base Taper Crimp Die Set. This is a two die set. Like the Forster uh, sets a two die set, we've got a resizing die and we've got a seating die. Now the sizing die is a small base resizing die. I don't know, probably not necessary, but the standard ones were out of stock, so whatever. This is the same set I used back in our 22 Nozzler series. You can see, yep, same type of dies. I've also got this set of dies in 300 Blackout. It is my preferred 300 Blackout dies. So I have high confidence that our new RCBS set of dies is gonna be good, hopefully. The other thing, Federal, which released the Valkyrie, RCBS, Alliant Powders, these are all part of the same group of companies. They're in one of those big mega group of companies. So you would think that RCBS had the, uh, the inside track on testing for this cartridge, you would think. So hopefully, hopefully this is gonna be a good die set. So like I mentioned, we're taking this one task at a time. Task number one is to resize some brass. These are 50 of the pieces that we fired in the last video. All I've done is pop out the primer and I wet tumbled them for like uh, 45 minutes, 30, 45 minutes or something. Just to clean them up a little bit, these guys are ready for sizing. So that's what I wanna do first. Let's try out our new RCBS sizing die and let's see if we need to bump the shoulder a bunch like we, like we did with the, uh, with the Forster. All right, so the first thing about RCBS dies, they come with about a half a quart of oil on them. It's crazy. Like somebody at RCBS has got to have a brother or family member in the oil business because I think they just, like they have this gigantic vat of oil and they dunk each die in the whole thing or something. They go a little overboard. However, better oily than rusty, right? Just be sure to wipe them down Get most of that oil off there before your first usage. Resizing die setup is pretty straightforward. These do have these do have replaceable decapping pins. It doesn't come with a spare, but you can replace them. You can uh, actually find spare decapping pins at most stores. Sell a little bag of you know five of them or something like that. They also have a really nice taper on the front of kind of the expander ball assembly here. I like the RCBSs. Because if you have, you know, dented case mouths or something where the expander is going to need to kind of spread them out a little, it does a good job at that. Now, one thing about this die, like this, I haven't really moved the adjustments yet, or actually it just moved on me a little bit. But you can see the, the black part here is almost down to the end of the threads. Eh, I guess the threads go up in there a little bit, and I'm an idiot. So yeah, there's more adjustment than I thought. Because it came out of the package with the decapping pin set about like that, you know, sticking out three and a half miles. What they tell you is the end of the decapping, yeah, the end of the decapping pin holder must be at least three sixteenths above the bottom of the die. So this guy needs backed up just a little bit, maybe just a touch more, there you go. That, that looks a little bit more reasonable. You don't wanna go up too high. You don't want your expander ball up, uh, you know, near where the neck is gonna be. And with a short little case like that, if you go too far, that could be a problem. So, all right, got this kind of tightened down a little bit. I'm gonna go ahead and, I thought I had a crescent wrench here handy, but I don't, so I'm just gonna try not to booger it up here with channel locks. There we go. That's enough, just to make sure it's in there tight and it's not gonna spin on us. So this guy's ready to go. So if you believe the instructions, what it tells you to do is screw the die into the reloading press until the sizer die touches the standard shell holder with the ram at the top of the stroke. Ram at the top of the stroke, screw it down until it touches. 
and then it says to lower the ram and set the die one quarter turn down farther. There's about a quarter of a turn and it says to lock down the lock ring. Yeah, it actually says a quarter down further so the press cam, so the press cams over center. Ugh. That's really camming over center. I'm going to back out just a touch. There we go. So we're still camming into the die. You might be able to see the, the whole press or the, uh, the turret of the press tilting a little bit. So that's our absolute maximum setting. Let's get a reading and see how much that setting bumps the shoulder of our case. All right, so we're using the Hornady Headspace Comparator Kit. I've got the 350 insert, which means that's a 0 .350 inch hole. In the last video, we talked about this a bit. It looks like the 330 or the 350, either one would work. On the SAMI print for this cartridge, it actually shows 340 as being the correct diameter to measure headspace, and we don't have a 340 insert. So we're just trying to get by with what we got. Okay, so 1.245 is the number we're getting before sizing. And I'll tell you what, I put some lanolin lube on these cases, but since this die's never been used, that expander ball, a little bit worried about it. I'm gonna grab some Reading Imperial sizing die wax and just put it down inside of the neck just to get that nice and goopy and lubed up. Did you guys write that down? Did I say 1.245, that, was that it? Yes, 1.245 before. Man, that felt like a lot of work. Yeah, that just went in there. Yeah, that guy really kind of went in there a little bit rough. Might just be, you know, the new die or whatever, I don't know. But it felt like a whole lot of work was getting done to the brass. The after number is 1.242. Holy crap. That setting only bumped the shoulder three thousandths. Interesting. Tell you what I want to do. I want to back it out just a little bit now to where it's not camming over so hard. Like right now, man, it's really, uh, really camming over hard. There we go. So that's a much lighter setting. It's still very, very firm contact, camming over a little bit, but maybe not quite as excessive as the previous setting. Okay, 1.245 before. I'm nervous, man. Like that that last one, re, it resized so hard. I'm gonna put just a little bit of Reading Imperial sizing die wax on here, just, just to be sure. I really don't wanna get a, a case stuck into our brand new die. All right, we lost a little bit. Now it's 1.244. So that guy bumped about 1,000. I'm really surprised by this. I think our Forster die went all the way to like, uh, 1.235 at a setting like this. So huge difference between our two dies. Here's what we'll do. Let's go ahead and size the first 10 and then we'll grab my upper and see how the cases are fitting. And I'll tell you what, let's see how much these guys are stretching. 1.588 before sizing and 1.596 after. Remember, 1.6 is our maximum case length for the Valkyrie. That's quite a bit of stretch. I think the bodies are just getting worked really hard in this small base die. 1.589 before, 1.597 after. Pretty stretchy. All right, let's grab the upper, see if these things fit in the chamber. Hmm. Doesn't seem to want to go. What in the heck? Let's try another one. That one went right in. That guy went right in. Hmm. Let me go back to the first one again. It doesn't want to go, man. Okay, try the others. Okay, 9 out of 10 went in no problem. It's just this one guy. Did I accidentally let one through that didn't get resized? No, nah, the neck diameter looks right, so I think it, it got resized. I'll tell you what, let me run it through the die one more time. Nine out of 10 ain't bad, but it ain't good enough. 
Now it went right in. And pull it out and turn it 90 degrees. See if that changes anything. Right in. Huh. Okay, another 90 degrees. Right in. You guys explain that one to me. Got me a little bit worried. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and resize these other 40 pieces at this die setting. Hopefully we're not getting ourselves into trouble here. All right, folks, we've warped to the following day and our brass, our resized brass, has been put in the tumbler for about 15 minutes with some hot water just to make sure all the lube was off of them. So these guys are lube free and ready to go forward in the reloading process. The only thing left to do is a quick uh, chamfer on the inside of the case mouth to make sure the bullets seat nice and easy. And that's pretty much it. I measured the length of every single one of these pieces of brass and they're all still under our maximum brass length. And it's just by a couple thousandths. Most of them are like right here, right around this guy, 1.598. Remember 1.600 is our max. So after this firing, we're definitely going to need to resize. But at least for this time, we don't need to worry about it. So I've been trying to decide which bullets to shoot. And I think what I want to do is I want to shoot three different bullets. We want to cast a wide net, trying to learn as much information as we can at this point. So as I mentioned earlier, I definitely want to shoot the 77 grain Sierra Match King. This is the exact same batch of bullets that we shoot in, over in our Mark 262 series. The only problem here is the only ones I've got have got the cantalure and the cantalure is not really appropriately placed for loading in 224 Valkyrie. So the cantilever is going to be way up above the case mouth. No big deal. Nothing to worry about. It's just going to look a little bit goofy. So that's bullet number one, 77 grain match king. The second bullet I want to shoot is the 80 grain ELD match. I also want to shoot this guy at a 2.260 inch overall length. Now it's a good bit lighter than our 90 grain Sierra match king, but as far as bullet length goes, they're almost the same. The 80 grain is just barely shorter than the 90 grainer. So we're kind of between the 77 we're going to shoot today, the 80 we're going to shoot today, and then the 90 grain we shot in the last video, like the 77 is much shorter than the other two. So it'll be interesting to see whether these 80 grainers will group. The third bullet I want to shoot is the 60 grain nozzle ballistic tip. Now, unfortunately, I'm a bit of an idiot and I accidentally ordered the version that does have the can lure. I think they offer both. The factory ammo for the Valkyrie with this bullet uses the version that does not have a can lure and the load data for this bullet on the Alliant website shows an overall length of 2.170. That leaves the can lure up above the case mouth. So this guy's going to look a little bit goofy as well, but no big deal. So we're just going to stick with that 2.170 inch overall length. As I mentioned earlier, we're going to shoot Power Pro 2000 MR for everything. And since we've got load data, for the 60 grain ballistic tip and the 90 grain Sierra Match King that we shot in the last video, the best way I could come up with for estimating a maximum charge weight is just to put it on a graph and see where the line falls. So what you're looking at here, all the way on the left, up at 31.5 grains, that is the max charge for the 60 grain nozzle ballistic tip. All the way on the right hand side, 90 grains at 27.1 grains, of powder is the max charge for the 90 grain Sierra Match King. So if we just use this line that connects those two charge weights as a general guide, if we look at where 77 grains would fall, it crosses right at 29.0 grains. If we jump over to 80 grains, where our 80 grain ELD match would fall, it's looking like it's, eh, it's probably closer to 28.6 grains where the line crosses, but we'll round that down and we'll make it 28.5 grains. Now this is a pretty stupid way to estimate max charges. It's got a high probability of getting us into trouble. So we're gonna to have to keep a close eye on the brass. Hopefully we don't blow our face off. And I also wanna shoot one grain increments. So here's our load data. The 77 grain Sierra Match King, I wanna shoot up to 29.0 grains. I wanna shoot 15 rounds with each of these bullets. 
So that'll be 45 total rounds for the range. We're just, we're casting a very wide net here. Just want to gather in some data and see if any of these guys want to shoot good groups. So the 77 grain match king goes up to 29.0. The 80 grain ELD match goes up to 28.5, which puts us starting at 26.5. And the 60 grain nozzle ballistic tip, this is straight from the Alliant data. 31.5 is our max charge. And we'll go ahead and just stick with the one grain increments with that guy as well, just for the heck of it. That'll take us down to 29.5. So we're covering a wide range of bullet weights. We're covering a wide range of velocities with these big one grain jumps in powder. So hopefully this is enough, you know, to learn something. So that's pretty much the plan. Like I mentioned a few minutes ago, I do need to hit these cases with just a little chamfer tool inside the neck, just a little bit, just to uh, shine them up a little bit, make sure that bullet seating is going to go well. So as soon as I do this, we'll be ready for primers. All right, so I'm getting our CCI 450 primers installed. And just like I had mentioned in the last video, this is the same brass, so it has the same kind of sloppy feeling primer pockets. All of this brass just doesn't quite have as much force needed to seat a primer than I would like. They don't seem to have gotten worse. They're kind of the same as last time. They just go in, they just go in too easy. There's just not, they're not quite tight enough. But until I can either get some new brass or get some Starline brass, I'm looking forward to trying the Starline brass. I think that's probably going to be the best option. Unless I want to explore things like maybe forming brass from 6.8 SPC or something else. I haven't really even looked into that or looked at the dimensions to see what the best candidate would be for forming brass for this cartridge. But hopefully Starline will put out a bunch here soon. That would be really nice. So the next step after this is going to be measuring powder, which is pretty darn boring. So I think what I'll do is I'll skip over that and see you guys at the bullet seating die here in just a minute. Okay, step number one with our new 224 Valkyrie RCBS die. Let's, uh, let's check the seating stem and see how well it seems to fit the bullets. This guy just backs right out the top. First, let's look at the 90 grain Sierra Match King. Boy, it does, it seems to ride pretty far up the ogive and certainly doesn't feel like a very large contact area. Now the true answer will come when we're actually seeding some bullets. Now, in the last video with our Forster die, it was leaving rings around the bullet and marking up the bullets. So we'll have to see if this guy is the same, but this is the 90 grain Sierra Match King. We're not even shooting it today. So let's look at the 77 grain Sierra Match King. Yep, that guy's the same or a little bit worse, perhaps. Here is the 80 grain ELD. Feels a lot like the 90 grain. And here is our 60 grain ballistic tip. Yep, that one's not great either. So this seating stem doesn't really seem to be a particularly good fit with anything. Now this die has got a taper crimp and I think the instructions tell you to set it up off of that crimp. So let's run a case up into the die. We'll screw the die down until we feel the crimp touch the case mouth. There it is right there. And let's go ahead and back it out. Oh, there's a half turn and tighten down the lock ring. We're not gonna be crimping any of these today. Our two bullets with cantalures, they're not going to line up properly anyway. And also, we didn't crimp in the last video with the 90 grain Sierra Match King, so we'll just keep things kind of the same on the crimp front. We're not going to mess with it. So let's go ahead and start here. I don't think the seating stem's even touching. Nope, it's not. First is the 77 grain Sierra Match King, and our target overall length is 2.260. All right, I think that's got us pretty close, seating the first few here. 
Now the first bullet, which I seated like 15 times trying to get the setting right, if you look, there is a very slight little ring where you can tell the stem was touching the bullet, but it is not bad at all. Like nothing like we saw from the Forster die in the last video. And if you take one of the other rounds that just got seated, just saw the die one time, I don't see anything at all. So that's good. Now these Sierra Match Kings have got a uh, pretty irregular me plat. The hollow point's always crooked and stuff, so a bit of overall length variation here is, is to be expected. 2.259, 2.255, 2.260, 2.259, 2.263, 2.259, and 2.259. Close enough. So it just kind of dawned on me, I didn't really check any of these bullets to see what their maximum overall length was in my upper before they hit the rifling. So one of our, so one of our completed rounds here with the Match King, I'm gonna go ahead and chamber it, make sure it goes in freely and doesn't seem to be hitting the rifling. It doesn't even come close to chambering. Wow, I don't know why. I didn't consider that earlier. I just seem to be making dumb move after dumb move with this cartridge. Now this is easily remedied. Let me just find my split case. What did I do with it? Yep, here it is. Just a case with a big old slit down the side. I'm going to put a bullet in there loosely and then go ahead and let the Yep, just let the rifling seat the bullet here. Then I'll pop this guy out and we'll see what overall length it gives us. First one's 2.127, God. Nothing like being 130 thousandths off here to make you look like an idiot. And imagine that, it's lining up just about perfect with the candler. So let me pull the bullet out, we'll repeat this exercise again. So I've repeated this a bunch of times and I'm getting, this is a very imprecise method. I need to get a case threaded so that I can use my Hornady overall length gauge. I just haven't done that yet. But right around 2.13-ish is what I'm getting. And that's just short of the can lure, just at the bottom of the can lure. So let me go ahead and take one of our rounds and I'll seat it down until the can lure looks just about right. I don't know what I was thinking. I must have been smoking crack. All right, here's right about 2.125. One of them was 2.125. This was 2.127. This should be just a, a little bit off the land. It's just a few thousandths. Let's see if this chamber's okay. Yep, that guy chambered no problem at all. That's awfully close to the lands. I'll tell you what, I'm gonna go down just a little bit more. Let's try and hit 2.120. There we are, there's a round at 2.120, absolutely perfect cantaloupe alignment. And we're like 10 or 15 thousandths off the lands. I don't know what in the world I was smoking with the number I came up with earlier. I don't know what would have possessed me to think that 2.260 was gonna fit with this sort of bullet shape. Yep, we're hovering right around 2.120. Got one as short as 2.117, and I, there's one that's like 2.122. Now, the other thing that does is it makes this top charge pretty heavily compressed. Definitely no powder moving, and I, I can actually feel it when I'm seating the bullet that this is a uh, pretty darn compressed charge, and we're still not marking up the bullet with the seating stem, which is a very good thing. Yep, a very good thing. Now, I was spot checking some overall lengths on the highest charge, and our overall length is still good to go. 2.121, just about perfect. So now the question is, did I make the same mistake with the 80 grain ELD match? So let me check and see what our max overall length with this bullet is. 
All right, so I've tested this guy several times and I'm coming up with about 2.292 as the length uh, where I hit the lands. So our 2.260 original plan is gonna be perfect. We're gonna be like 30 thousandths off the lands. So at least in my gun, should be perfect. So I need to back out the seating stem. All right, I think I've got our setting for the ELD match. And unfortunately, it does look like the stem leaving a little bit of a mark on this bullet. See, right up there, just below the tip is where it's hitting this guy. Now this guy got seated multiple times. Some of the ones, I think this last one here only got seated once, but it's still got a little bit of a ring. And I feel uh, powder moving, so this is not a compressed charge. So if we got into some heavily compressed charges with this bullet, that might be a problem. Let's double check our overall length here. 2.263, and 2.264. Close enough. Okay, so our max charge with the 80 grain ELD match, 28.5 grains, is a little bit compressed and it does seem to be making the distortion of the bullet a little bit worse. Yeah, that kind of sucks a little. So we're not gonna do anything about it in this video, but depending on how well this shoots, maybe we'll do a little bit of work on this seating stem in the RCBS die in the future. I'm kind of peeved at both Forrester and RCBS for giving us seating stems that just don't fit the bullets we're all gonna be shooting in this cartridge. All right, 60 grain ballistic tip, split case. I'm gonna see what the max overall length is with this guy. Now with this one, we're sticking to Alliance published data. So we're probably in good shape with our original plan of 2.170 inches of overall length, but it doesn't hurt to check. I already got the upper sitting right here. Might as well check it. And also the factory ammo with this bullet, I checked its overall length in the past and it was, it was 2.170 as well. And I've already shot that ammo before. So I think we're in good shape. So I've run it a couple times and almost every time I'm coming up with 2.187. So 2.170, we're gonna be less than 20 thousandths off the lands. So we definitely don't wanna stretch it out any further than the 2.170 we're already shooting. Another thing we haven't checked here in this video, with our new uh, resizing die, I did check the expander ball in this die and it is a little bit smaller than the Forster. If you'll remember back to the last video, I was a little bit concerned that we didn't quite have enough neck tension. So with this brass, I'm getting a pretty consistent 0.248 around the neck here before seating a bullet. I probably should have waited until we've got the, the die set before I get into any of this garbage. All right, I've got our die set now, 2.169. 2.169, I went a, just a touch too short, but no big deal. So now back to our neck tension discussion. Yep, very consistent 0.248 inch diameter around the neck. And afterwards I'm getting 0.250. So the last video we were getting one one thousandths of, of difference in this measurement, and now we're getting two one thousandths. So we've got a little bit more neck tension here with our RCBS resizing die. I consider that a very good thing. Just the nature of the AR action, rounds are gonna get banged up, right? I mean, and, and I don't want bullets setting back or stretching out. So a little bit of extra neck tension, I'm happy with. Check a couple overall lengths here. All right, double checking a couple overall lengths here. 2.169, 2.170, 2.264, good to go. All right, folks, I think we're in pretty good shape. I just need to finish seating these last 10 bullets. And that's all she wrote. So I'll meet you guys out on the range. All 
All right, folks, it's time to rock and roll. If you watched the last video, you might have noticed that my bolt was not locking all the way to the rear every once in a while. And just because I don't, you know, get the, the view from that side very easily, I wasn't noticing what was going on. I thought I was having a magazine issue where the magazine wasn't locking all the way up in because what would happen was the bolt wouldn't lock all the way back. I'd load up the next five rounds, I'd throw my magazine in and I'd drop the bolt and it wouldn't pick up the round. I think I know what was going on there. In the course of that last video where we were testing brass inside of the upper a bunch and we were testing bullets inside of the upper like we did just a little bit ago in this video, I had, the, I had everything dry. Like I had cleaned it up and nothing was lubed up so that I didn't get oil all over myself when doing that sort of stuff. I had forgotten to lube up the gun before the range session. It got a little bit dirty and then towards the end of that video, I think that's what was going on. The gun was dirty, the gun was dry, and it just started not quite locking back. Now for today's video, we are nice and lubed up and ready to go. We'll see if we have any of those same problems in this video. I suspect that we won't. So we're shooting at 100 yards. The dots down there are one inch in diameter. We're gonna start out with the 77 grain Sierra Match King. Man, I'm glad we caught that problem with the overall length. I still don't know what in the world I was thinking. So yeah, glad we caught that. So my gun has got an 18 inch white oak armament barrel with a one in seven twist. This is a BCM upper and handguard, a Rainier Arms bolt carrier group with a bolt that I also got from white oak armament. LaRue MBT trigger, a Vortex 24 power scope, and we're shooting off of a bipod and a rear bag. I've got my Caldwell Ballistic Precision Chronograph out there to get velocity data for us. So let's get started. We're shooting at 100 yards. Did I mention that? Every video where I forget to mention the distance, somebody in the comments is like, how far was that? It's always 100 yards, folks. It's always 100 yards. All right, first up, 77 grain Sierra Match King, 27.0 grains. Let's see if they'll group. The gun is warm, by the way. I just moved this scope back over from my 223. I shot five rounds through it to make sure that my zero was still good and we're in good shape, but the gun's warmed up. Okay, so first shot there, the brass looks good. The velocity looks just about right. That was 2,722 feet per second. So let's see if it'll group. All right, folks, that's more like it. That's not a bad group at all. Okay, so the rest of our brass looked great. It looks like our bolt held all the way back, no problem. So 28.0 grains is next. Let's make sure. Yep, no problems there. All right, let's see if it'll group. Okay, so looks like our bolt locked back, no problem. Velocity up to 2851, which is a little bit depressing, folks, because we worked so hard in 223 to get up to 2750, 2760 over in the Mark 262 series in 223, and here we are shooting 2851 with our, with our medium load here in the Valkyrie. So our group did open up a little bit there. The brass still looked okay. Now this is the one that's got me nervous. These one grain jumps in powder are kind of nerve wracking, not really a smart thing, but let's see if it blows up. Okay, good, it didn't blow up. And our first piece of brass looks great. Not so much as an ejector smear. All right, let's see if they'll group.
Okay, so we made it up to 2930, which isn't too bad. No pressure signs whatsoever. Now the 75 grain factory ammo that I've been shooting, the American Eagle stuff, shoots a little bit faster than that, but it generally has some light pressure signs. So looks like we've probably got some room to move up here with the 77 grainer. I don't know if we can hit 3,000 feet per second, but we ought to certainly be able to flirt with uh, 2950 before we'd run into problems. The accuracy shows promise with the 77 grain Match King, but I was hoping we might see some groups that were a little bit better than those. Well, let's move on to our next option. This is the 80 grain Hornady ELD Match. The first charge weight with this guy is 26.5 grains. Let's see if these will group. Okay, so our first uh, velocity here with the, with the ELD match is 2689. The piece of brass looks fantastic. No problems whatsoever. So moving on. Yeah, so that's one of those groups where the group size probably kind of is going to suck. But it was trying to group. I'm sure you guys can probably see the target moving on the screen. I am dealing with a little bit of wind today, which it's not a problem because it's coming from directly behind me straight towards the target. The wind itself, I'm not freaked out about, but it keeps moving my stupid target. I need to build a proper like target stand down there, a permanent target stand at my 100 yard line. I'm going to do that this spring, but that doesn't help us today. All the brass looked fantastic, so we're moving on. 27.5 grains is next. All right, so the group wasn't very pretty. The brass looked absolutely 100% perfect though. No worries there, but man, it jumped up to 2802. That was 140 feet per second jump, which I guess if we get another 140 feet per second jump and end up at like 2940, that's probably about the right velocity range for this bullet. So yeah, I'm gonna have a close look at the first piece of brass here for this group. So 28.5, let's see if it blows up. So the brass looks perfectly fine, not even an ejector swipe. Good. Let's see if it'll group. All right, not gonna lie, I was hoping for some better accuracy there out of the 80 grain ELD match. But the good news is that we didn't see any pressure signs whatsoever. Those groups certainly could have been worse, but not quite as good as we would have liked to have seen. So next up, 60 grain nozzle ballistic tip. First up is 29.5 grains. So velocities look good, the brass looked good, the group looked like crap, so more of the same. Moving on, 30.5 grains.
All right, so that's another disappointing group. The brass still looked okay. The velocity looked good. Our standard deviations are pretty good here so far with the 60 grain nozzle ballistic tip. But we've only got one more chance to shoot a good group. Let's see if it'll do it. 31.5 grains. The first piece of brass here at our max charge looks just fine. Moving on. All right, so the brass on that group looked awesome. And that looks like our best group of the day. So that's a good way to end it. Let's get back to the bench, talk all this out. All right, folks, let's have a look at the brass. Third row here is our max charge with the 77 grain Sierra Match King. Nothing serious here. You can see an ejector. I need my little pointer thingy or something. There we go. See around the ejector mark there, a little bit of a smear. I can't be sure if that's from this shoot, uh, this firing or a previous firing. The primers, even though these pockets are loose and sloppy, the primers aren't getting flattened, and it's all pretty good. Is that another little mark up on this guy? No ra nothing raised up, no burrs, nothing, nothing serious going on here. This is better than what I'm seeing from the first firing, you know, with, with the factory ammo. A lot of those definitely do have ejector marks and slight signs of pressure. All of our hand loads so far have been better or definitely no worse than any of the factory ammo, which you know leads me to believe we're probably in the right range as far as pressure goes. So seeing as how we were at 2,930 feet per second here with the 77 grainers, I'm very happy with this. These three are from the 80 grain Hornady ELD match. Once again, nothing super exciting to see here. Is that a little mark up there around the Y on that dude? Yep, looks like it is. But nothing you can feel. You know, here the, with the third firing, there is a little bit of, you know, rim scratches and stuff from the ejector on most of the cases, but nothing bad. I'm not seeing them like bend or get screwed up. So looking pretty good here at 2,885 feet per second with the, with the 80 grain ELD match. And here are three pieces from the 60 grain nozzle ballistic tip. So this was published data so we can be a little bit more certain that we were pretty close to an actual maximum. Bit of a swipe here on this left hand guy. But primers looking round, the rims seem okay. And I couldn't be happier so far with uh, how our brass is turning out here with the Valkyrie. Good stuff. Now I saw a comment on the last video here a couple days ago from somebody saying they had shot the 90 grain Fusion, Federal Fusion factory ammo. And I wanted to show you guys, these are the 10 pieces of Fusion brass that I've fired. And these have definitely been some of the worst signs I've seen from the different types of factory ammo I think they all have a swipe, bit of a bit of a smear, and there was one piece in particular that had a little bit of a burr. Yeah, this guy down here on the end, and maybe the one right next to it. Kind of got this little bite into it on the ejector side. So yeah, that guy who, who uh, posted that comment, I didn't get a chance to reply to him. So hopefully this is better than a reply. This is what this is what the the 90 grain fusion is looking like coming out of my gun. It's not bad. I'm going to use, reuse all of this brass. None of it is awful, but a little bit more than the other types of factory ammo. Okay, folks, let's have a closer look at some of these groups and we'll start out with the 77 grain Sierra Match King. This was definitely our best shooter today, but that's not really saying a whole lot. Our first group of 0.940 inches 
was one of only two groups we shot today under an inch. But at least I guess it was kind of consistently mediocre here, you know, from 0.940 inches up to 1.123 inches at the second group. So it seems to be hovering right around that one inch mark. The first two groups, I think the, the first shot was the high one. It kind of opened up the groups a little bit here. Just, just like by the eyeball test, it looks like maybe there's some accuracy to be found here. I think the bullet was flying well. So maybe another powder or maybe next time with this bullet, like, I, you know, we were, we were lined up perfectly with the cantaloupe. Maybe we'll try a little crimp. I don't know. I was very happy with the velocities. Like I mentioned out on the range, you know, 2750 is a pretty tall task in 223. So just blowing right by it by almost 200 feet per second here with the Valkyrie is impressive to me. And I can't wait to see what some of you guys get out of your longer barrels. Like some of you guys who are buying 24 inch barrels, I can't wait to see what sort of numbers you get because at this point, it doesn't seem like we're giving up a whole lot with our little 18 inch barrel, getting really surprising numbers to me. So that's, yeah, that's what we had with the 77 grain, the 80 grain ELD. Now, one thing we got to keep in mind, remember back to bullet seating, we put a big old ring in, the, in all of the bullets when we were seating the bullets. And I can't imagine a big ridge running around the ogive of all the bullets is very good for their flight characteristics. So maybe that had something to do with it. We're going to need to do some seating stem work here with the 80 grain ELD or hopefully one of the Forster seating stems will work better with it. But yeah, the groups here were pretty gross. 1.018 inches up to 1.525 inches. Not quite what we're looking for. The velocities are pretty good though. I mean, I reckon we could probably push this guy. I mean, certainly we can hit 2,900 feet per second. So we'll, we'll definitely be returning to this bullet, no doubt about it, but we should probably do it with a better seating stem set up. And last up is the 60 grain ballistic tip. This was kind of a surprise to me, man. I thought, I thought these were gonna group. The last group was the, our best group of the day at 0.662 inches. See, that's the other problem, you know, shooting these big one grain increments in powder, we might just be jumping right over top of the accuracy nodes or whatever you want, whatever you like to call it. We're probably jumping right over good loads and not knowing it. Maybe that's what's going on here. So maybe we could refine that 31.5 grain load and tighten these up a bit. That's certainly possible. Velocities look pretty good, 3239. The box of factory ammo on the box, it says 3300 feet per second for this, uh, for this load on the factory ammo. I can't remember what, uh, what readings I got from the factory ammo. I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but I think we're just a little bit short of it. I seem to remember I was about 50 feet per second slower than the box. So probably around 3250. So we're in the, we're in the ballpark, but it's pretty fast, pretty impressive velocities all around. So where do we go from here? I kind of liked today's format where we took a couple bullets and characterized the powder a little bit. So I think I want to stick with this, but we need to get the 90 grain Sierra match King back in the fold. So here's what I think we should do. I think we should take the 90 grain Sierra Match King, the 77 grain Sierra Match King, and I haven't decided yet on a third bullet. The 60 grain ballistic tip might not be a bad idea, but right now I've only got 100 of them. I could order more if I needed to. Maybe we'll make the third bullet a bit of a wild card bullet. We'll rotate some different bullets into the third slot. So we'll always shoot the 90, 90 Match King and the 77 grain Match King and then we'll rotate in an interesting third bullet as we go along. That, that seems like a decent plan. I like that. That sounds fun, because we gotta find some accuracy. Here's what I think we might do. Next video, we might switch to some Vitavori N140. Actually, I'm thinking N150 might be better, but I can't remember whether I've got a can of N150 or not. I need to dig through my uh, powders and, and, and see, but N140, has been a really excellent accuracy powder in 223 for me. So maybe that's where we'll go next. I'm not sure, I'll think it over, but that's kind of what I'm thinking. Good news, no malfunctions today. So who knew? Lubing up your AR is important. I really think that's all it was, folks. I was just running a dry bolt, which is never ever a good, good idea. Now, since I put the standard low profile gas block on the barrel, I'm really happy with the way White Oak Armament set up the gas in this gun. It's been just about perfect. All the brass is ejecting out to about four o'clock. None of my cases are getting banged up, slamming into the brass deflector or anything like that. So it seems like they gassed this thing just about perfect for shooting, you know, without a suppressor, of course. You know, that's another thing. Maybe next video, I'll go ahead and throw my suppressor on because that really helped. Over in 6.5 Grendel, the last barrel we bought, which was a Faxon barrel, 
that barrel just shoots better with a suppressor than it does without. So maybe that might help here. Yeah, I think that might be uh, worth a try here, or at least we'll characterize it in the next video. We'll load up a load, shoot it suppressed and unsuppressed, or maybe some factory ammo or something, and see if maybe, uh, maybe that'll help a little bit, because we're struggling to find accuracy right now. I tell you, after, after resizing the brass in this video with the RCBS small base die, man, I, I wish the normal dies would have been in stock. I probably would have bought the normal dies if they were available. Because that small base, small base die really seems to be tight around that base. So the body of the cases were getting worked pretty hard. They were stretching quite a bit during resizing. Which I, I don't think that's a problem. I don't think we're giving up any accuracy because of it or anything like that. It's just for the long term, like looking down the road here, it might not be the best thing for brass life, you know? I don't know. We'll just have to see how that goes as we move forward. As I mentioned, I think the next video will... We'll mess around with some crimp with the 77 grain Match King. We'll try out that taper crimp in the seating die because I don't have any other uh, crimp dies right now. Lee, as far as I know, isn't making a factory crimp die for this guy yet. And that's what I generally use. So might actually have to, uh, yeah, just go ahead and crimp with the seating die. Yeah, we'll get it figured out. We will absolutely get it figured out. I really owe White Oak Armament a good video just on their barrel, but I don't want to make that video when it's just going to shoot poorly. So I want to get it figured out before then. And that's another, like, I don't think I mentioned it in the last video. I haven't mentioned it yet, yet in this video. And that's not really like me. The, the White Oak Armament barrel we're shooting, White Oak did send me this barrel. I'm not doing a very good job of shilling for him right now. I'm probably not selling too many barrels. But to be honest, with out of all of the parts involved, the barrel is the least of my worries. I have faith that this is a, a good shooting barrel. We just got to get it figured out. And maybe we will start trying to uh, mix in some new equipment. Like maybe next video we'll switch uh, bolt carriers. The uh, the Rainier bolt carrier I've been using so far. It's not a new bolt carrier. I've had it for quite some time, but it is an old. It's an old nickel boron bolt carrier that all of the nickel boron coating is gone. <laughs> it's a little bit janky. So maybe maybe we'll throw in a different bolt carrier for the next video. And I mean I'm I'm totally willing to move the barrel over to a different upper. Like maybe we'll take our 223 upper which we all know it shoots very well. We'll just swap the Valkyrie barrel into that guy just to make sure there's not something, you know, else weird going on with the platform that might be causing us accuracy issues. So I envisioned this video as going a little bit quicker, but it's turned into another hour long monstrosity. It's also going up a couple days later than I wanted. And to be honest, that's because uh, I had a job opportunity come up, just a short term, like part time, contract sort of a job opportunity come up. And I've been trying to split time a little bit over the last couple weeks. I'm not exactly hiding it from you guys, but I also didn't want to whine about it. Like, you know, boo-hoo, you shoot like five times a week, stop crying about uh, needing to work a little bit, right? I did, you know, yeah. I didn't want to invoke that sort of response, but it has, It's it's been uh, a little more time consuming than I anticipated. And it's kind of cramped my style here over the last couple weeks a little bit. Plus you throw in all of these uh, random problems we're having in 224 Valkyrie and it's just slowed things down quite a bit. But I'm almost done with that and hopefully I'll get back into the normal pace here over the next few days. But the good news is that, you know, working this job uh, is hopefully going to be able to fill that gap between income and expenses and at least keep us going into the summer. No doubt about it. We're almost up to 350 supporters over on Patreon. You guys are using the links down in the description, my affiliate links, and that brings in some money and the super chat donations during live streams and all of that stuff. The channel just keeps on growing and I really appreciate it. And I'm just trying to hang on long enough for this guy to be, uh, to be self-sustaining. And I hope these last couple weeks of videos getting out slow, I haven't been able to participate much in the comments and stuff, but hopefully all that's going to change and we'll be back to normal here within the next uh, couple weeks. Tell you another thing I'm thinking. If you weren't, like I know we've got a lot of new subscribers, maybe they weren't around all the way back in August. I did a video every day challenge back in August. We po posted a video every single day. It was a nightmare. It was awesome. Now that the days are getting longer as summer approaches, I really want to try and do that again. It's a huge challenge, but it's also a huge motivation for me. So I'm thinking May, maybe May or June, once the days are nice and long, I was going to try and do it this winter, but man, when it gets dark at 5 p.m., there's just not enough time, just not enough range time to uh, to make sure I could get it done. And I didn't want to do it, and then I was just going to immediately fail. 
if I do it, I want to try and complete it like we did last time because it was it was a lot of fun. So maybe that's coming up soon. Appreciate you guys sticking with me. I appreciate all of the support and I will see you next time.